The Great Pyramid of Giza emulates the rays of the sun in its perfect triangular shape. It was built by the ancient Egyptians in honor of their pharaoh, King Khufu, as a monument to his legacy and a tomb for his spirit to pass on to the eternal afterlife that they believed in. It would take 20 years for paid workers to transport and assemble over 2 million stone blocks of limestone at the site built in Giza, the stones weighing from an average of 2.5 tons up to 50 tons at the base of the foundation. But why was this grand pyramid built in the hot, burning desert all those centuries ago? There are many, many theories on how it came to be. But it all started with the idea that workers built ramps and transported the heavy blocks on sleighs, as the wheel had yet to be invented. If only Khufu could tell us exactly how they did it, so it wouldn't be a wonder of the ancient world. I, 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 I. Can't a pharaoh get some shut eye? Oh, mighty pharaoh Khufu, it's an honor to speak with you. You bet it is. Now let me answer that first question about why we built the Great Pyramid in the desert. One word. Sand. S-A-N-D. Lots of sand. What do you mean, sand? Oh, sand means everything. Sand paved the way for transportation. Sand is the ramp. Sand is the road. Sand is the storage area. Sand is a pillow for already cut blocks in the quarry. Sand kept the pyramid straight. But why ramp made of sand? It wasn't me. My father built his pyramids on ramps of sand first. Why not other ramps? Moving all that sand seems like too much work. Can you imagine how much sand you will need for just one ramp? Yes. Just as much time to make bricks for a brick ramp. But then you will have to add to the ramp with every new level of the pyramid. Yes. We had to do that too. However, we did not wait a minute for it. While one team is laying stones, another is adding sand to the ramp on the other side. Not only that, overall construction time is heavily decreased compared to other ramps. Sounds all good to be true. What aren't you telling? Well, I cannot lie. The pyramid cannot be built as tall as the glory of a pharaoh. Unlike the other ramps, sand is limited by height. Ah, oh, yes. It's true all pyramids built by your father and your sons are not tall enough. Yes, that was a lesson learned at the cost of my father. The trick is all in the slope. The behavior of sand limits how tall you can build your ramp. When it is too tall, the sand ramp begins to fail, which means Pharaoh fails to finish the pyramid. Your father never did finish his first pyramid, the Pyramid of Natum. The slope on the side of his pyramid was too high. The sand couldn't hold and just kept pouring down. By the slope you mean the angle, correct? Angle? Sure, yeah. Let's call it that. So after the first pyramid, Dad started round two. But the angle of the second pyramid was almost the same as the first one. Yes. I tried to tell him this. In order to finish, he would have to reduce the angle and shorten the pyramid. Today it is known as the Bent Pyramid. My father reduced the angle of inclination of the pyramid from 54 to 43 degrees. The pyramid began to have half its height with an angle of 54 degrees and half its height with an angle of 43 degrees. But the sand ramp did not work. Sand fell on the shoulders of the pyramid and cannot reach the penultimate row. As soon as my father expanded the base of the pyramid, the height of the pyramid with an angle of 43 degrees becomes slightly higher than the height of the pyramid with an angle of 54 degrees, and the sand ramp became working without any problems. Third time's a charm. 
he successfully finished his third pyramid. My father was getting old at this point and didn't want to risk building another, so he built his at an even lower angle than I built mine. If it wasn't for his mistakes, I would have never figured out the right optimal angle, which allows me to build a pyramid as high as possible with limited height of the sand ramp. I owe the red pyramid quite a lot. So how did you find your angle? It didn't seem like you just guessed. First of all, I found this angle by chance, inscribing and describing the square. Then I found out this angle is a constant. I did a small pyramid test and found it is an optimal angle that would build the highest pyramid possible. The angle you're describing is 52.35 degrees. But without knowing that, how could you keep it consistent each time you added a cent? The workers used a rope with three knots to line up each layer. They would continuously check it because it had to be right each time. Once the angle was marked on each corner of the pyramid, the workers marked spots on the floor of each side. Why did you choose such large blocks for your pyramid? It was the sand ramp that decided size. Sand is a very heavy material, especially compact sand. The sand ramp would have destroyed the pyramid under the weight of itself. If blocks are too light, the sand ramp may set between them and move them apart. We had to lay down blocks very close to each other with no gaps. Therefore, you can't insert credit card between the blocks. Credit cards? Never mind, continue. Anyways, big blocks made the most sense. Tell me a secret. How did you achieve the straight lines in all your pyramids? What complex technology did you use? Who were your engineers? Remember who built the pyramid, the workers who worked generations in the fields. They fished and they hunted. They were not educated. Today's average six-year-old was smarter than my workers. All I could do was use their muscles and give them simple tasks. The pyramid is the only important project in my life, and I cannot rely on complex instructions that my workers could not understand. They could not read or write. They often did not know their left from their right. I put the most savvy in charge. The sides are uneven because the pyramid was built with two opposite ramps. Each new row began by first changing ramps. The worker's task was to start new rows by laying stone blocks from the same corner position every time. Then put blocks in by the herringbone system. Herringbone system? Did you guys figure anything out? I will show you. The first row, they start off by laying blocks from the front left corner. While building out from the corner, they made relatively even lines to the adjacent corners. They would lay blocks until they reached the control line. But because our stones were not equal in size, the opposite sides would not be even. On the next row, they would start from the opposite ramp from the same front left corner. The workers continued to lay the stones in this way until the end of the construction. I see. With each alternative row being even, it creates illusion of perfectly shaped pyramid. The stone pullers did not cross each other's paths. Likewise, there were no delays from the pullers waiting to haul the next line of blocks. This made it very simple for the workers, allowing for the pyramid to be built very quickly. It looks like a spiral once the pyramid is completed. Yes, it looks like a spiral around the pyramid. These lines are secret. The pyramid looks very even with uneven rows. The Egyptologists calculated that each block of stone must be lifted every three minutes if they were to go up one by one. Is that the speed of delivery for your construction? Well, pretend you are at the market and only one merchant is selling produce. The line is huge. Then the other merchants start selling produce and the line disperses. Now they can sell produce 20 times faster. Now you can compare speed of delivery. In the worst case scenario, my workers can deliver blocks of stones from 100 slaves at the same time. When you consider that half of a pyramid is 87.92% of all stones laid, then the highest productivity falls on the first half of the pyramid. From this, the average delivery speed of 30 to 50 slaves could be moving every 10 to 15 minutes. So it had to be easy to build it had to be strong enough to last 20 years to get all the traffic done for the construction of the Great Pyramid. Actually, it took me just five years to deliver blocks to the pyramid base. 
However, just preparing the blocks and moving them to the construction zone took the full 20 years, even into the five years of construction. We built a road to be able to move the blocks efficiently over the rocky plain. The surface was hard to move anything across it. 10 years just to make the road, five years for the pyramid, and another five years for the interior rooms and corridors. Okay, I see. Many other pyramids have moved blocks one by one. In your case, blocks move up the pyramid line by line. Yes, from the beginning the blocks would move all at the same time. But during construction they would be in different positions depending on the distance needed to travel across the actual surface of the pyramid. That all makes sense. But this roads, I have never heard of this theory. The road was built with the help of sand and the same size stones as the pyramid itself. So in the end of construction, we can use them too. Therefore, there is no thumbprint today. What kind of sleds did they use? How did they move those sleds across the floor of the pyramid? Was it a bunch of logs on the floor with workers rolling the stones on top of them? Oh, that's not a bad idea. But Egypt is very poor in wood, but there are a lot of palm trees, reed, and papyrus. The sled itself needed to be light, smooth, and durable. In addition, the floors of the pyramid were made with blocks of the same height. Sometimes it was not necessary to fill the middle section of the floor with correct form of blocks. They were mostly needed on the sides. Each team had several bamboo panels. But bamboo doesn't grow in Egypt. In Egypt, we don't have granite either. We get all of our materials we need from other places. The panels were one to two yards wide and three to four yards long. They were light enough to carry by one person. So the panels lay down on the surface of the pyramid panel by panel. So let's move across each panel. The workers used baskets for sand delivery. Also, the workers used mats from the palm leaves or reed when they needed to move blocks close to each other. That way the leaves would rot away and leave no trace. Just take a look and you will see why. The workers are going to walk on the sand ramp? No. I have never seen this wall engraving. Yes, this image of the construction process exists, but no one understood the meaning of it, and it does not fit with the all existing theories. We didn't want to use solid wood sleds because we needed to attach the blocks to the sleds with rope all around and under the sled. I've seen a lot of theories, but never one with the rope attached to the opposite side. Egyptologists tell us your pyramid was lined with a white stone. The sides of my pyramid look nice and smooth from far away, but each row is uneven. In order to cover each block with face stone, it has to be measured individually. Plus. The pyramid must be completely clean of the sand. It takes a lot of time, time I didn't have. Your father made his second pyramid with facing. My father started his second pyramid with high angle, then he realized he wasn't going to be able to finish the pyramid with this angle. He had no choice but to reduce the angle and finish the pyramid. He has two facing sides. Because the blocks have gaps in between them, if sand were to get in, it would destroy them. Some blocks were too light under heavy sand ramp. But his third pyramid has no facing. Because it wasn't necessary, he used big blocks that were able to resist the sand ramp. It seems today like your pyramid has eight sides instead of four. Can you imagine how many millions of visitors have climbed the pyramid for the past 4,500 years? And of course, they will use the shortest way to climb. They trampled a short path. The visitors did not climb Kafir's Pyramid because it has smooth surface at the top and it risked getting hit by falling stone. Or the small pyramid of Mankura, of course, climb less since it is higher. My workers had no idea how the land beyond the horizon looks. In the modern world, we know the world is round. It was a privilege for my workers to see land above the birds. Now you can see all functions of the sand during construction time. Oh yes, the desert was chosen for the construction of the site. 
send helps everywhere. The RAM, the support for opposite side, the storage for the inquiry, the rope. It's genius. Do you know how the Stonehenge was built? Oh yes. They use nature's material the same way for construction. They don't have a lot of sand in England. But they have a winter with a lot of snow. Oh, I'm so excited to hear your story. Ancient workers of Stonehenge were also uneducated but very savvy. They noticed how Mother Nature and its weather conditions could help in building of the monument, the road, and to facilitate labor. The workers chose the winter time to build? What did they do in the summer? I think they prepared big stones for transportation first. They cut them into the right shape. I heard the quarry of those stones were 150 miles away from the site of the construction. They studied the terrain, mapped the path of the future road, and uprooted trees if necessary. They built temporary winter houses for seasonal work. As soon as the snow fell in the right conditions, workers proceeded to the construction of the road. Did they bring the snow on the slab? No, they simply rolled snow into snowballs and rolled them to the road construction site. I understand that areas should be completely open without trees, so there's enough snow on this road section. Correct. They built the road with boards wide enough to fit the big stones, then waited for favorable weather. What kind of favorable weather? Well, from the beginning they needed a little thaw and then in frost to make the road covered with ice. The workers built so many road sections as much as the weather conditions allowed to build it. They left stones in the field till next winter. How will they move such big stones? They lit a fire on and under the stone itself. When the stone was heated, it could be moved. How? It's slippery? Yes, for the stone, but not for the workers. They pushed the stone from behind and walked along the sides of the road. How did they install the stones vertically? They warmed the ground with fire. They dug a hole for the stones to be placed. Then they poured a mountain of snow around this pit like a mountain with a crater. They built an icy road to the one side of the crater. As soon as the road becomes icy, the workers push the stones into craters. Correct. Some workers kept a stone while others covered the crater with the snow and water. Then Winter did her work. The stone was embedded in the ground in a vertical position. In the springtime, when the snow melted, the stone remained standing like a monolith. Yes, they built the second one by the same way. Before they moved stone into the crater, they would warm stone with fire to make it move. The third stone they laid horizontally on the two vertical ones in order to bond them together. They came up with a lock. On the top of the vertical stones, they cut down the bulges in the shape of a semicircle. Inside the third horizontal stone, they cut holes for them. Before setting the third one up on the top of the two verticals, they covered the stones with snow flush bumps. I know now. When the snow under the third stone melts, the third stone will bed down into the lock. I think I have a one last question. What if they need to move the stones across the river? Simple. Just look at this picture. This is genius. All ingenious is simple.